Well, this morning, uh, as you know, we're doing our sermon series, a few of our favorite things. Uh, and this morning, we have the privilege of having our youth director share uh, her favorite verse this morning. And so uh, you probably know her. I talk about uh, her on a regular basis, um, but and she's on the worship team. Abby Garcia, how long have you been at, how long have you been at the church now? Okay, she, so came to the academy in third grade, so a long time ago. Um, no, she's not that old. But it's a great blessing this morning because uh, we value children's and youth ministry. And so uh, Abby's getting to share today. Pastor Joe will share. Uh, Pastor Joe Manning will share in a few weeks. Uh, it would be a great opportunity uh, to share their favorite verses and to bless us this way. And so this morning, could we please uh, just give uh, Abby a warm welcome as she comes to the stage to share. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Uh, like Pastor Spencer said, my name is Abby Garcia. I'm the youth director for Calvary Student Ministry. Uh, that's the youth group, youth ministry for, uh, for the church. So we meet on Sundays. So we are meeting today <laughs> from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Building A, the house-looking building over there. Um, and I'm super excited because we just started our Summer of Fun. So what we're doing is every week we're doing a fun new summer activity. And uh, the, tonight we have our infamous Nerf Wars. So if, you have, if you're a teenager and you have a Nerf gun or you would like to loan one of our Nerf guns and you like to shoot people in the head with Nerf guns in like a safe way, uh, please come. It's going to be so much fun. And with the whole buddy barrel challenge going on, I would like to say <laughs> the youth did it also for a summer of fun. And they raised over $500 to speed the light. And I got pied in the face really, really hard. <laughs> Um, but super proud of them. Yeah, you can put the picture of the youth up there. Uh, we have seen so much growth and, and so much just blessings. Uh, I've only been uh, the youth director for like a year and change. Um, and the Holy Spirit really has been moving and has just blessed me. I'm so honored to be able to be a part of a group um, that all these teenagers are just yearning for more of the Holy Spirit. They just want more. Uh, and I just, I'm honored to just be able to witness it. Uh, and allow God to use me. So I also wanted to <laughs> thank my amazing leaders because we uh, we um, experience growth quite rapidly. So I thank them for being so patient with me and being so flexible. But if you've been at Calvary, like Pastor Spencer said, I am on the worship team. You probably recognize me more over here than you do over here or over there. <laughs> so I love the worship team. Can we have a hand for the worship team actually? <laughs> What a beautiful, what a beautiful and sweet time of worship. Um, if you have any, if you have a love for worship and your love for Jesus overflows through worship and you have a gifting in music, uh, please join. We love to see new faces and we love being able to nurture those giftings. So don't be afraid. Come, join us. We're great. Um, if you've been at Calvary a very long time, you probably know me first as either one of the Garcia girls or Mario and Chona's daughter. <laughs> You can put the photo of my family up. Um, look, those are my sisters. How gorgeous are they? They surprised me. They're here. I was so happy when I saw them. <laughs> um, in one of the photos, I get cut off. That's unfortunate. But <laughs> the ones on the left, I'm the one in orange. Um, and then from starting from the left is Camille in the black. Um, she has a twin, Catherine, and then my youngest sister, Ashley. You can see in the photo right there, she just got engaged. The random guy there is the one she got engaged to great guy super happy for her and we're very close uh, we all live in different states which i think is the reason why we're so close <laughs> we have to be very intentional with our relationship with each other which has been amazing um god is moving in all of their lives and it's it's, it's been very as the oldest of all of them it's been such a blessing to watch uh, my parents are in that photo too uh, they still come to Calvary. Ironically, today is the one day that they're, they're not here <laughs> because yesterday was their 30th wedding anniversary. Um, so, yes, they did it. It's so fantastic. We love marriage and love. <laughs> um, so I was gonna, I, when I saw that I was uh, speaking today on the summer preaching schedule, I got really excited and I wanted to surprise them. Um, but then my dad beat me and then surprised my mom to a trip to Vegas. So that's where we are right now. So, hey, mom and dad, I hope you're having a great time. Najita. <laughs> so, um, I'm very excited to be able to do this series with you guys. I see it as an opportunity for you guys to also get to know me and get to know my heart a little bit more. That way I'm not just a face behind a piano or a face far, far over there. <laughs> yeah? So, um, like Pastor Spencer said, 
I've been here for a very, very long time. To say that Calvary is an important part of my life is an extreme understatement. <laughs> so um, I am first generation Filipino American, proud of it too. Uh, my, so that means my parents are from the Philippines and they came to the US uh, and they had me and my sisters, we lived in New York. Um, but then 9-11 happened and they decided to relocate us to New Jersey. Uh, from there, they enrolled me into Calvary Academy. I was here for third and fourth grade. Loved it. Highly recommend. What a great school. And I'm not just saying it because I went there or because I work here. Um, <laughs> I, I loved it. And when they decided to switch schools for me, we decided to just make Calvary our home church. Uh, so I was in around fifth grade, and we just never left. <laughs> so we came to, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Calvary's great. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that, my parents did every single week as we came to church. It's about a 30-minute, we live in Jackson, so it's about a 30-minute drive. My dad had my sisters and I recite 30 verses every single week uh, by memory in the car. I did not like it. It was not fun. <laughs> but he wanted to instill in us the importance of knowing the word um, and being able to really understand it. But when you're, when you're like 13, 14, 15 years old, I don't want to be reciting verses every single week. I dreaded it every, all the time. I told the youth this one week. They were like, I don't even know if I know one verse. <laughs> I was like, guys, read your Bible. <laughs> Jeez. But I commend my parents um, for doing that because, again, there are four of us. And each of us had to recite 30 verses. So they had to sit through 120 verses every single week. And we didn't say new verses. Work smarter, not harder, right? I repeated the same verses over and over and over again. And big verses, like Psalm 23, didn't count. It had to be one, in, 30 individual ver Anyway. <laughs> but anyway. But let me tell you something. Even though I dreaded it growing up, learning those verses, that routine, up till now, the last time I did it, I was 18. I'm 29 now. I still remember all of those verses. <laughs> and what... and. Though doing that routine also is the reason why I found my favorite verse. And I didn't understand it then when I was repeating it over and over and over again. Um, but th when I shared it with the youth, they asked, like, did you resent them for making you do that or force you to do that stuff? And yes, my parents made us recite verses every single week. They also made us pray together as a family and go to church every Sunday. <laughs> but I might, have, uh, might not <laughs> have not understood it when I was growing up. But now as an adult, I get it. Stuff like that instills habits in us. It emphasizes the importance of praying together, reading and knowing the word, and coming to the church on Sunday for community. But what I also told the youth was that they never made me go to youth group. They never made me serve on the worship team. They never made me um, accept Jesus into my heart, you know? They let me make those important choices on my own. And when I joined the youth group, I was so excited. I came to this one. And at the time, the cutoff was seventh grade. So... At the time, we met in the gym, and the Joy Center wasn't a thing. The Student Center, Building A, was just a bunch of classrooms. And um, I remember when they pitched the idea of the Joy Center. I remember when they broke ground, too. Pastor West, like, did the, the shovel thing, right? <laughs> so um, but when they decided to build the Joy Center, they also decided to renovate Building A and turn it into the Student Center that we know now. So a lot of people helped and volunteered with renovations and constructions, and they also asked the youth to help. And one of the cool things was, a couple weeks back, we had, like this year, we had Calvary Work Day, uh, and I was cleaning out the dungeon. It's not a real dungeon, it's just a storage closet. We tell the students it's a dungeon in case they misbehave, we tell them they're going to, you know. Um, and you can put the next, <laughs> the next slide up. Bennett comes running in, and he's looking around, looking for toys um, with his little, little boys, and he's like, he saw something on the wall. And he goes, what's a linguist? Now, if you've been at Calvary long enough, you know, Pastor Wes was the, <laughs> was the pastor before Pastor Spencer. He had a daughter that came to youth group with me. And when they broke ground, not broke ground, when they were renovating the student center, they let us etch our names um, on the foundation of the student center when they were renovating it. Next to Susanna's, la Susanna's name, I found mine. <laughs> you can see it there. And a little ways away, you can see Cassie's. Is she here? Oh, man, oh, no, I'm so sad. That's okay. I sent it to her. But this, I sent those pictures to them, and they were like, I don't remember doing that. I was like, I don't remember either. It was so long ago. But it was just amazing that, to make our mark like that and seeing it so many years later. What I do remember is when they were renovating the sanctuary, and they pulled up the carpet, 
they let all of the youth write their names and their favorite verses on the floor. And same thing, the verse that I kept reciting over and over in the car, I remember where all me and my friends wrote it on the ground. I put my name and I wrote my favorite verse. Now fast forward to like a year, a little over a year ago, I'm sitting in front of Pastor Spencer in his office and he called me in. I immediately thought I was in trouble. I don't know what I did, but he was like, I need to talk to you. I was like, okay. Um, during then, he starts telling me about how um, Pastor Joe Gunter found a, he decided to accept a position as a senior pastor in Florida. Still with so much joy for him, but also a lot of sadness. I'm like, I've been through a lot of transitions in this church. And I was like, man, what am I do again? And I was like, what if he leaves us? Or worse, what if we don't like him? What if he's not cool? <laughs> but then he decided to tell me we, we want to split it so there's a family pastor and a youth director. And we now know the family pastor is Pastor Joe Manning. Great guy. He joined BBS. He should help. And then we also want you to take the position of youth director. Immediate panic. I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> I got really, really nervous. I got really insecure about my age, my inexperience. I didn't go to school for ministry, but I've been a youth leader for a long time. And the verse that I wrote down on the floor of the student center, the verse that I repeated over and over again that I have to recite, every single week going to church came into my mind and encouraged me. And it's the one, it's the verse that I want to encourage you with today. 1 Timothy 4.12, take a pick. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. This verse encouraged me when I was a teenager, it encouraged me in my adolescence. It encouraged me in my 20s. It encourages me now. <laughs> so today, I wanted to be able to break it down with you today and get you to get to know my heart. Um, so let's, let's break it up. First part says, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. Uh, more often than not, you'll find that adults like to look down on young people because of their age. I feel, that, I feel like that is a big mistake. Why? <laughs> Because young people can shift culture. We look at culture now, we see things in social media, TikTok, Instagram, and stuff. You see things trending, or sounds trending, jokes trending. A lot of the times, a young person is behind it. We even see, think about slang. I, I looked up Gen Z slang. I know, how millennial of me. Um, <laughs> and I, I wrote some of, them, some of them down. I know what some of them mean, so I, I, I didn't, it didn't completely crush my ego. But uh, things like, see if you know them, Riz, Mid, Fam, Getting Canceled, Big Yikes, No Cap, High Key, Low Key, Simp, Take the L, Regular W, What's the T, Woke Culture, Living Rent Free in My Head, yeah, uh, what else is it, Vibe Check, Period, but with a T at the end, uh, Main Character Energy, and Sus. I use Sus a lot. I know that one. It's short for Suspect. Didn't get that. <laughs> but all this stuff... And what's funny is some of those words are not even trending anymore. Because <laughs> now, because of technology, because of like the ADD nature of this generation, everything has to be changing. Everything has to be moving. If you are like stuck in one spot, they're going to leave you. <laughs> they're going to be like, oh, boomer. Th that's not even a trending word either. It was. Oh, man. But what always surprises me, not surprises, what, what I love is young people have the ability to create revolution, to start riots, to start movements. When they see a need, when they're passionate about something, they run after it, you know, because they're not completely tainted by the world yet. So they're like, I want a purpose. I want to do something bigger. And when it's fueled with the right thing, oh, my goodness, the change they could make. But we also see how the world is now. And when, they, when, they, when they're broken and they operate in their brokenness, they go in a direction that is not, it's of the world and not of the word. So yes, young people have so much potential in them. Now the second, yeah, the second half of this verse, sorry, I lost my place, um, is set the example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Let's break it down even more. Set an example for the believers. How can we, invest in the next generation? How can we teach them 
how to live holy? How can we how can we show them what it means to be a Christian? We set example for the believers in speech, in the words that we say, in the in the way that we encourage them, because words are powerful. They're so powerful. I know there's the thing, sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt me. I think it's kind of a lie, but like it's also true. Don't let words hurt you, but it depends on where you put your value in, where you put your validation in. When we say things, how we speak to others, how we teach and how we gossip, how we lie. Here's things to remember, especially as adults, as parents. Kids and teenagers are like sponges. This is such a vital part developmentally for their life. They are watching the things that we do. Have you noticed they have like an elephant's memory? When you mess up and they see, they're, gonna, they're not going to let you live it down until like, the day you die. <laughs> so also coming to them with humility. Are you willing to admit that you're wrong? Are you willing to apologize? Because the things that you do, they're learning. The things that you say, they will copy. Are we speaking life into them, or are we discouraging them? A couple weeks ago, I did an exercise with the youth where I had them write their insecurities on a post-it note, small. Then I had them cr crinkle it up and then toss it. And then I had giant pieces of paper where they had them lie down, and they traced themselves in it, they wrote their name on the top, and then I had all of them go around to everyone's thing and write compliments and encouraging words on them. Even the kids that didn't really know each other, they put, like, you're cool, you're pretty, superficial stuff. <laughs> but I had the leaders go around, and on theirs they put things that the Bible says they are. Child of God, worshiper, belongs to Jesus, made in his image. And it was, it was an amazing time. I loved being able to watch them encourage each other. Now this is the thing that I wanted to bring up. I posted notes that they wrote. They were small for a reason, but I looked through some of them. And they're anonymous, so if there are any teenagers here, I'm not going to out you. <laughs> but some of, the insecurity, some of the insecurities they had, you can tell which ones were girls and which ones were boys. The girls had, I'm insecure about my hair, my, my skin, uh, I'm ugly, my nose. Like very beauty focused, because that's what society is always telling them, that's what's feeding them. And you can tell the ones that were boys because it talked about their masculinity. I'm weak, I'm short. It shows how, what they're listening to, what they're seeing, how the media and society is feeding into them. But the one that also intrigued me was, there was ones that you can tell, it was not ones that came up on their own. It's things that were told to them. I'm annoying. My ADHD is annoying. I'm lazy. I'm a burden. It's not, it was not normal lingo for a teenager to come up with by, itself, by themselves which told me there are people in their life telling them this, telling them that they're annoying, telling them that they're a burden, telling them that they're lazy. And even though it seems like just words, when you're that, at that age and you find validation in your parents, your friends, the media, it affects your self-esteem, it affects how you present yourself to the world. And there was one post-it note, broke my heart, in all caps it just said everything. This generation, especially when you're a teenager, everything is elevated because it's your whole world. When you go to school, let me tell you something. I think the hardest missions field to infiltrate is the public high school system, <laughs> especially in this day and age. And we are sending our, our teens there, we're sending our students there, and are we equipping them with the armor of God, with with words of truth, even with encouraging words, letting them know that they can do it, that they are called to go and make disciples just as much as we are called to go and make it disciples. Set so an example for the believers in life. In some versions it will say conduct. I grew up saying life, so we're going to say life today. How we live our life, our actions. When we people see us, how we act, does it reflect the life of a Christian? Does it reflect the life of what the word says we are called to do? I tell this to the students all the time. There are a lot of unsaved people out in the world. And a lot of them have resided to the fact that they do not want to step in a church. They do not want to believe in God based on what maybe what they see in media, maybe what they see in social, in social media, what have you. 
So this is what I tell them. I say, you might be the only reflection of Jesus non-believers may see. How vital is that? So when you're on the parkway and you're driving, <laughs> no, I'm not, people aren't saying, oh my goodness, that person's a Christian, they're driving really fast, ah! No. Or like in Colossians it says, do everything in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm not saying when you go to you get your mail, all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, but what happens when you get your mail and you're, you see your neighbor? Unsaved, are you like, well, I don't want to talk to them. Or are you gonna are you gonna treat them like Jesus would? You're gonna love them like Jesus. Which takes me to the next one. Set an example for the believers in love. We are called to love all people, no matter what their brokenness is, to lead with love and to love like Jesus. Even if they don't believe in God or follow him. I have a friend that attends here. She's not here, so I'm not gonna use her name. We'll call her um Susie. Susie brought her friend, we'll call him Mikey. And Mikey is someone who identifies as part of the LGBTQ community. Came in with like beachwear, nails, um, and they sat over there, I remember. And I will say, whoever, whoever met him that day, great job, Calvary. You loved on him so well that day. <laughs> but I got to know him, and he was telling me how he had a little, he wasn't really one to go to church. He wasn't sure how he... What, where he fit with God, where he believed in God. But this is the thing that really resonated with me. He said, I don't know where I am with a church or with God, but I see the good and the love of God through Susie. And that's why I'm here. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Are we... The unsaved friends we have, the neighbors, the co-workers, are we loving them like Jesus would? Do they see the love of God through us? Are we seeing the love of God, are they seeing the love of God through us? Every decision that we make with our friends, are you asking ourselves, am I loving them like Jesus? Is the way I'm treating them like Jesus would? Set an example for the believers in faith. Faith is believing what you cannot see, right? The same way you can't see wind, but you know that it's there. But do we have big faith? I think as a teenager, it's kind of hard to imagine that there is a big God out there watching you. There's so many people on this planet, right? Like why in the world does my life matter? Do every decision that we make, are we doing it with big faith? There's a song, Give Me Faith. Uh, but I love the words. We give me faith, trust what you say, because you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. The bridge I love, it goes, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. There's so many people that I encounter where they're afraid to give up control. And that's the big thing. They don't want to give up control because they don't know. They're afraid of the unknown. Very type A. I'm very type B. I'm like, God, take it. I don't, your plan is better than mine. <laughs> but are we operating on big faith? When big things happen, are we trusting God to take all of it? Do we really believe that God has, can, can, that we can give God all of the control or does that freak us out? And when we have those doubts, understand, there are teenagers and children watching you. If you're afraid to take those big leaps of faith, how are they going to, be, to be able to take those big leaps of faith? Trusting God with your financing, trusting God with your future. So much of my 20s, I felt I was stuck and I was frustrated at God. And I was like, God, I don't know where you want me to go. What do you want me to do? I'm trying to fix it by myself. I'm trying to make the plan on my own. It wasn't until I was like, God, I, I, I can't, I can't do this by myself. I give you everything. I give you everything because your plan has to be greater than my plan. Because what I'm doing right now is not working. <laughs> and even if you think your plan is working right now, imagine if you gave up control and gave it to God, how much more 
he could give you? Do we operate on big faith? And is the next generation watching us? Do they understand how important it is to operate on big faith? Our flesh may fail. Oh, I love that line. But God, you never, never will. When we pray, do you operate on big faith? Sometimes people say, just pray about it as a cop out. No, pray with faith. And believe that God will answer it. Because he will answer it. It will be a yes or no or not yet. Makes you exercise your patience a little bit, you know. Set, example, set an example for the believers in purity. We talk about purity, we're talking about our soul. When something is pure, it is without flaw, it's without any extra ingredients or materials. Think pure gold, pure alcohol. We are naturally sinful creatures. We will mess up. But living with purity means that we're striving to live as Christ-like as possible. But now, listen, we'll never be perfect. But we're, again, we're aiming to be like Jesus. So what does it mean to set an example through purity? How often are we coming to the feet of Jesus and saying, God, I messed up? Because listen, I know. From the day that you accepted Jesus in your heart up until now, you messed up, but best guess. <laughs> so how often are we coming to Jesus with our brokenness? We're coming to Jesus with our flaws and our mistakes. And we're saying, God, here is everything. I messed up. Maybe we're too scared. Maybe we're too scared to admit it. We're, we're stuck in a cycle of addictive habits. Might be ruining our relationship with our spouse, our friends, our family, with Jesus. Or maybe you think it's not affecting them at all. Guess what, it's affecting you, it's affecting your soul, it's affecting your heart. How often are we willing to admit that we did something wrong or that we're doing something wrong, that we're stuck in these addictive cycles? But we stop, we don't, we don't want to admit it because we might be filled with shame, we might be filled with guilt. We don't want to admit that we're wrong. It comes back to control. But again, the next generation is watching us. The non-believers are watching us. I have another song for you. <laughs> I love, here's the thing. I love just coming to God in worship. Because sometimes when you don't have the words to say, when you don't have the right words to pray, worship can fill in those gaps. It can express what your heart wants to say to Jesus. The song I've been having on repeat is Refiner by Maverick City. <laughs> uh, the chorus, I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. The bridge, clean my hands, purify my heart, because I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you, only for you. It's beautiful, isn't it? How often are we coming to Christ asking him to refine us, to purify us, to take away all the bad, to take away all the sinful, to take it all away? Or are you comfy in your sin? Maybe you're afraid of change. Maybe you're comfy being lukewarm. But imagine when you come to Christ with everything and just say, listen, I'm imperfect. I am broken. I am hurting. I give it to you. The things that the, that the Holy Spirit can, can transform in your life is unimaginable. Our little human minds cannot comprehend the glory of God. <laughs> so why are you holding on so much to control? 
leaping with big faith, trusting and asking the Holy Spirit to refine your spirit, to purify your heart. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. Do not let anyone, including yourself, look down on you because you are young in age, young in wisdom, young in your faith. This verse is used a lot in youth ministry, but do not, don't reserve it just for teenagers. This is meant for all of us. Do not let anyone, anyone, non-believers, yourself, your parents, your spouse, anyone, look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. I hear that verse and I also, it reminds me of the importance of pouring into the next generation. But more importantly, the importance of also being consistently being poured into. When I accepted the position as youth director, I was like, God, I don't know anything. <laughs> Will you place people in my life to teach me? Because I know if, if this is all the knowledge in the world, this is how much I know. <laughs> so God, put teachers in my life, put mentors in my life, please, because I do not know what I'm doing. In the year that I've been doing this, oh, God is so good. He has blessed me with so many people in my life that have corrected me, that have guided me, given me great advice and encouragement. I, I would like to emphasize, I am a byproduct of youth ministry here. I'm a byproduct of the missionettes here. I look in the audience, I see people who have taught me. I see people who have invested in me. So one of the things that one of my mentors have taught me about learning about the word is not just looking at the one verse, but the importance of understanding the verses before and after it, but also who wrote it and why. So if you would indulge me, uh, I'm going to ask my friend Michael <laughs> to come up. He is one of our youth students, and he's going to take us through. Yes, Michael, what a guy. <laughs> He's going to take us through 1 Timothy 4. And I want you to listen to the words and also the tone of how it's written. You got it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, join, join me, man. Is it on? Hello? Wait, 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 wait. This is an on button. This is a switch. There we go. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, Devote to the public reading of scripture, to the preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yeah. Okay, you can put it back. Isn't it good? <laughs> Listen, if, you, if you've seen Michael around, he seems very quiet. Never underestimate the quiet kid. I know, I was, I was that person. 
Um, great job, great job, my friend. I, I also have him read during youth because his voice is so bombastic, it wakes everybody up. So, <laughs> um, so he read through 1 Timothy 4. Now, the Timothys, 1 and 2 Timothy, was not written by Timothy, but for Timothy by the Apostle Paul. And what, this is what I love. When I had this realization, it really it made me pumped. You can hear in the tone of the, of the chapter, it's giving him instruction. It's giving him, letting him know what's going on in uh, the, the is, he's going to Ephesus. Um, but really got me is we know that Paul is writing all of these letters to Corinth, to, you know, Philippians, Ephesians for the, to the city of Ephesus. And who is Timothy? Timothy joined Paul and Silas, we can see it in Acts, and joined him on when they were doing their missionary journey. And he learned from him. And he watched him. And they served alongside each other. So when Paul was in jail writing all these letters to these big churches, these big books, right, he thought it was also extremely important to write a letter to Timothy, the person that he mentored, to tell him what he needs to do because now it's his turn to go and be a missionary. He understood now it's him, it's like him passing the baton from him to Timothy. Telling him, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. And I thought that was so cool. <laughs> I was like, wow. So let me encourage you to ask God to place people in your life that will uplift you and support you and love you well and mentor you. I... For in between, like I said, I've been a youth leader for a very long time. But for a lot of, ooh, sorry, for a lot of that time, I was struggling with depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD. Sometimes frustrated with God. This verse always kept me centered. But I decided to join youth ministry. And let me tell you something. The amount of spiritual healing I felt while serving was remarkable. Why? How is serving so healing? Because it forces you to let go of your hand, of everything you're holding on to, and allow it available for the God to fill. So if you're struggling here and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to serve anywhere, like I'm too, right now I'm going through stuff, like I, I don't think I'm ready, I'm too young, or I'm inexperienced, I'm too broken. No. If anything, your experience can minister to somebody else. It can speak life into somebody else. And also allow you to be surrounded by people who love the Lord. Don't deprive yourself of, of being a part of the church, of being part of God's kingdom because you're insecure, you're afraid. There is a place here for everybody. I was here for many transitions for Calvary. And every leader that came before me invested in me in some way. I had a visual. Can we put uh, the old picture of the old youth up? I have to dig for this one. Can you find it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm somewhere in there. There was a lot of us. And we met in the gym. And I had this, this God gave me this visual of, me going to the youth of, over there, <laughs> of them, going in, and in the back would be me and my little friends, me and seventh grade me, going up to her and saying, hey, can I tell you something? And she'd be like, what? And I'd say like, when you let God lead in your life, this ministry, you're going to lead. She'd be like, No. <laughs> But what an amazing visual it was for me to be able to grow up in this ministry and now leading it, watching it grow. One of the most amazing visuals that I love is seeing the altars filled with teenagers on fire for Jesus. But what I love even more than that is when they start praying for each other without question. Because they want more, they yearn for more. This generation is curious. They want answers. My generation was like, all right, we'll do what you say. Fine. Like, but this generation goes, why? Why do we have to do that? 
after asking the hard questions, but it's good because we know the answer is Jesus. And they want to know those answers. They yearn for that. So how do we tell them? We set an example for them in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Be mindful of the generation that is around us. Don't, don't write them off. Because they're not the future of tomorrow. They're the, the church, they're, they're, they're the church of right now. If we do not invest in them now, we're gonna lose a whole generation. And when we lose a generation, we lose the church. How vital it is to understand the importance of young people, to invest in them. So think about the teenagers in your life. Think about the kids in your life, your neighbors, your kids, the kids that live in your home. <laughs> or maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a bus driver. Wherever you encounter teenagers, they are watching you. And they know, let me tell you, I said it in the interview a couple, in my interview with Pastor Spencer a couple weeks back. They know when people are being genuine. And I know when they feel the genuine love of God. And they're going to run with it. The revolutions, the, the, the movements we can see. We need to speak life into this, <laughs> speak life into this generation. Because they are our hope. God is going to use them. Like we've seen it now. The Holy Spirit's moving in the academy. We've seen rapid growth in the youth. God is moving. I'm just an honor to be a part of it. <laughs> Join me. <laughs> Church, I want to encourage you today that you are not inexperienced enough, that you are not broken enough to serve anywhere. And teenagers are not that scary. Kids are not that scary, I promise you. <laughs> Is there any teenagers in this room right now? Can I talk to you? My sisters, my family's Filipino, like I said. My sisters call me ate. It means big sister in Tagalog, the dialect that my family speaks. So my name has been ate, big sister, my entire life. Taking this position, I realize how important that title is. And I take my, my title of big sister very, very seriously. So I want to speak to you now. God sees you. God sees your heart. You might seem small. You might feel like your problems are in, in, insignificant. But he sees you. He sees your heart. And he has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Do not think that he cannot use you. Because you're too young. Do not think he can't use you because you think that you're not good at anything. You saw today with Michael, everybody has a gifting. And there is no age limit. There is no deadline for when you can use it. Teenager, know that you are not alone. God sees you in your brokenness, whatever it may be, big or small. And he will be with you. Even when you feel like he's not there. Live with big faith. Speak life into yourself and your friends. Ask God to refine your spirit. And to lead with love. Church, continue to pray for this next generation. Also pray for me. That would be great. I need it. <laughs> but... Faith without works is dead. Pray with fervor. Pray with big faith for this next generation, for the leaders that are leading them. Ask God to place people on your heart and, and pray and fast for them. We are not meant to live a life of 9 to 5, going to work every day, and then driving on the parkway, getting annoyed at everybody, and then going home, and then that's our, that's our life, and then we die. <laughs> there is more to life than that. And if we are able to give up control, give up the plan that we have set for ourselves and give it to Jesus. I want to see this church filled. I want to see this church filled with broken people, wanting answers. I want this church filled with young people, old people. <laughs> on fire for what we know, sorry, is the truth. 
So church, I encourage you today, teenagers, I encourage you today. You are not alone in this life. If you need a community, I'm here, you got one. I'll be your ate if you need it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for my Calvary family. I thank you for um, the children's ministry and the youth ministry and the people willing to uh, sacrifice their time for it and invest in them. God, you are such a good God and you see this church. May your spirit just flood the pews and flood their homes, guide their steps. May you let their hearts break for what breaks yours. God, let their hearts break for what breaks yours. Right now in this space, God, I pray that you just overwhelm them with peace and love and just a fire to ignite them, to pursue the calling you have placed in your life. God, you are so good, and I thank you for every person here, young and old, because you have a purpose for them. May your spirit um, urge their hearts, God to want more, to look for more and not be comfy in the life that they have settled in. May they not look down on themselves because they are young. But teach them and show them how to set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I love that Abby pointed out is that uh, she's a product of Calvary Lighthouse. The investments that have been made over the years in our youth, in our children, they pay dividends. And uh, Abby is a product of those that have invested. Pastor Joe Manning, he didn't grow up at Calvary Lighthouse, but he did grow up going to, he graduated from Calvary Academy. Uh, he grew up at Life Chapel in Point Pleasant. He's a product of uh, those men and women that invested in young people. I started in ministry when I was 12. I started volunteering in the children's ministry when I was 12. And uh, I'm a product of men and women that invested in children's and youth ministry. You see Abby's perfectly suited for what she's doing, working with teenagers. You can see there's clearly an anointing and a call in her life. And she's our youth director just because she's not credentialed yet. Uh, our plan by this time next year is that she'll be Pastor Abby. Uh, but it is, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Send your kids to youth ministry. Make them, it's, it's a, have the fight. It's fun, they'll enjoy it, they'll get over it. But have the fight. Let them come, make them come. Because it's worth the investment, it's worth the time. Vacation Bible School is not just fun, it's investing. Teenagers serving in Vacation Bible School and in children's ministry, it's not just busy work so that they're not bothering us in service, it's investing in them. It's a great opportunity, great opportunity. And I, I love the, the point that you made, Abby, it's wonderful that let no one look down on you because you're young. You might be new to the faith. You might be spiritually young. Don't let anybody look down on you. Because I guarantee you, you know more than the babies in the nursery. You can invest in them. You have an opportunity to serve, regardless of how long you've been saved. Regardless of how old you are, there's a place for you to serve. What a great reminder. What a great reminder of how we can serve by setting an example purity and life and speech and love and deed and all that we do. It's a great challenge for each and every one of us. Good word this morning, Abby. We appreciate you. Appreciate what you shared this morning. Amen. Just a couple of quick reminders before we bless you. Uh, just remind you, uh, BGMC, bring your buddy barrels next week if you didn't. Uh, we'll find out who's going to get a pie in the face. I'm 90% certain it's me. Uh, and so if that's if the girls win, and so, but I saw some guys putting their barrels in the girls' barrel this morning. 
And so uh, drop that off next week. One day to feed the world offering. If you didn't have a chance to participate, we'll, we'll continue to receive that for the next couple of weeks coming. Uh, Vacation Bible School kicks off tomorrow night. If you're interested in volunteering, we'd love to have you be a part of it. Uh, you can. There's a meeting immediately following service today in the Joy Center, uh, just down where the kids are serving. It's going to be a great time. What a great blessing. It's a great blessing. I want to invite my friends from the prayer team to come down as you stand, as you stand with me. My friends from the prayer team, if you come down and make yourself available. Maybe something Abby shared this morning challenged you and you'd like some prayer for it today. Or perhaps the Holy Spirit was speaking to you in the midst of worship or you just came in today with something on your heart that you need, you, you need prayer for. My friends on the prayer team would love to pray for you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing on you. And when I say amen, if you need prayer, I would invite you to come down. Let my friends pray for you. Otherwise, we, we would be so blessed by you if you could just continue to pray for our children's and our youth ministry. Pray for this week as they serve. Pray for the pray for time. Everybody, regardless of what you can physically do, everyone can pray for our children and youth ministry. Because somebody said it so very well this week, the devil's not even heightened his attacks anymore. He's just openly attacking this generation. We need a spiritual hedge of protection around them. And I need you to be a part of doing the spiritual work of praying, praying protection, praying safety, praying wholeness of their minds, praying health. We need you to engage in that. You might not be able to run around with a bunch of teenagers playing Nerf Wars. You can pray for them. You can pray for them. That at the very minimum is your ministry to the next generation. I challenge you in that. Every day, put it on your list. Pray for Abby. Pray for Pastor Joe. Pray for our teenagers. Pray for our kids. Pray for Calvary Academy. It's a great opportunity we have. I want to pray a blessing on you this morning. And if you need prayer today, when I say amen, I would invite you down. Let my friends on the prayer team pray for you. Lift your hands to heaven. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, this morning I pray you bless your people. Bless them in their coming and their going. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their families. Bless them in their workplaces. Bless them in their neighborhoods and their communities. Father, I pray you bless them with a heart of compassion for this generation. That you would set up a passion in them that says, I need to do 